my classmate and the native of Braxton County. I double majored in chemistry and math. Went on to Cornell, got an MS and a PhD in chemical engineering. Wow. A graduate of Harvard Business School, part of an MBA in international finance. His profession spans 40 years, senior advisor for Morgan Stanley, a partner at two private equity firms, panel of partners at Netwell Water formerly CEO of KMX Corporation and President of Sovereign Trust. Hugh is an internationally recognized authority in global infrastructure, having led some of the largest water energy and transportation projects in the world. <coughs> His honors go on and on if you can read about it tomorrow when we honor him. He serves on many boards. He has spoken to the United Nations twice. Mm. Hugh hasn't been back to the Philippines since he left yet. And it's a thrill to have him here. One short thing that I learned last night, you have something in common with one of our other award winners for the weekend, Dan Unger. Uh, you told me last night that Dan Unger gave him the only B <laughs> in the religions of the world. Correct. Grade school, high school, graduate school, college. <laughs> <laughs> I want to redo it. <laughs> When Dr. Unger watches this, you should have an opportunity. And I just want to say, that, you know, I think maybe Hugh's GPA turned out to be just slightly higher than mine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here's Hugh. I took, obviously I was a techie, so I tried to avoid anything that was non-technical, but I was forced, of course, force is the wrong word, of course, uh, to take some other classes. One of them was the class in speech. The only class I ever took in speech was here. Luckily, getting an A minus, barely, 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 and uh, I think I've gotten better. At least I've tried harder, and I've done a lot of them over the years. And so I'm going to try to be a little better. W one thing, just to share with you, how, how significant this is to me. I never use notes ever, but I made notes for today, right? <laughs> just in case. But I, I'm probably not going to use them. Hopefully not. And and I remember a couple things from speech class. One of them is it's important to have a focus and a title. And I thought about what would be a, a useful title. Lynn didn't help at all. I said, what do you want to talk about? She said, pick anything. So I said that, well, that wasn't going to work. We'll have to pick something that's at least semi-interesting. So I'm going to call this Serendipity and James Hanger. So I'll leave you with that, and hopefully I'll come back and explain to you why this is Serendipity and James Hanger. Serendipity we'll start with. So Serendipity is the name of my boat, actually, and, and it, it essentially, as you know, refers to um, happy circumstance and hopefully good things happening accidentally through life. I actually don't think it's always luck. Some of it's luck, so hopefully we'll talk about that. One of the other things I learned from speech class was, you know, always tell a good joke. And I really, my fraternity brothers would know, I, I'm not good with jokes. And um, so I had a nice book. It's called Podium Humor. I'd recommend it to absolutely anybody. It's great. Um, I want to tell you one quickly that's relevant, but it's not in Podium Humor. Just because we're, we're back in West Virginia, and I can tell this joke because I I was in Rome earlier this week chairing the international conference, and it would not be one appropriate for there. Um, very briefly then, so um, I grew up in central West Virginia, actually, in a, and um, come from a family of preachers, grandfather, four uncles, three cousins. Uh, spent a lot of time in church. Uh, and we had one of my uncles, well, actually two of my uncles were itinerant preachers, if you remember itinerant preachers in the day. One had a mule, one had a horse, and they would literally go around communities and, and basically preach whenever they could preach. And, and my one uncle would tell the story. He would show up. He showed up at this um, place. I think it was a barn, and there was only one person there. It was an old farmer who showed up, and, the, and the, my uncle said, so what? And I said, I'm not sure what to do, you know, because, you know, good Baptist ministers, we, we launch in for forever. We're passionate, and we'll be here for a while. What should I do? There's only one of you. And the farmer says, I don't know anything about preaching, but, you know, if, if he says, I'm just a farmer, and if I, you know, I, Cal showed up, I'd feed her. And a, and a minister said, you know, I take that. That's good advice, and I'll, I'll accept that. And um, so he launched in. A couple hours later, he, he said, okay, that's it. What do you think? And, and the farmer says, I don't know anything about preaching. He says, I'm just a farmer. And, you know, but, you know, if that Cal showed up, I wouldn't feed her the whole damn load. <laughs> and, and, um, so I'm not, I'm not going to give you the whole load. I'll, I'll try to just um, 
give you a little bit of you know my experiences and hopefully things that are semi-relevant to some people. I wouldn't even call them advice. I'll just call them observations and maybe a few of them are, are relevant. So serendipity, uh, for me, and, and I think it applies to a lot of people in the room, it's funny where we start and where we end up and, and, or where we're going. I mean, I grew up in a log house in Braxton County, West Virginia, and, out and the outhouse still exists. And, um, and you know, no, no, no uh, indoor plumbing and all those good things. And, and today I have, you know, a house that does have indoor plumbing and, and that's all good stuff. Um, and had no idea I'd be where I'm at professionally or personally, you know, had no idea. Somebody had said that, you know, I mean, again, earlier this week I was in Rome. Um, we did a press conference with uh, BBC related to the project we're doing with NEOM, which I don't know if you're aware of NEOM, but it's the world's largest infrastructure project. We're building a new city in Saudi Arabia. 560 billion dollars and if you told me a little kid from West Virginia could spell Neom you know a few years ago I'd say you're full, you're full of crap <laughs> so anyway so it's funny where we go and so I'll just touch on a couple of those things at least for me and, and maybe some of that will be relevant to you um, and I do think there's a couple of messages in that one of them is you know I, I went to Braxton County High School which many of you would know where that is and when I came out of Braxton County, all I knew is that I wanted to be, well, I knew two things. I didn't want to be on the farm where I was. I knew that. Didn't know where, but I didn't want to be on the farm. Didn't want to be a farmer. Didn't want to be military. Didn't want to be a coal miner. I'd done all of, I'd been an underground coal mine as a, as a, as a uh, one summer. Didn't, knew I didn't like that. I learned a lot about what I didn't like. What I didn't know is what it could be. And, and for me, and in talking particularly to university groups a lot, students, role models are so critical, just so critical through life. I mean, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I had no role models for what I wanted to do. I had no idea how somebody would start a business. I had no idea what a chemist would do, an engineer would do, um, you know, any of the professional people. I had no, no clue, really no clue. And so, and really no really good guidance about where to go to school and how to do any of those things. And so... Uh, the long, the very quick version is I was going to go to the University of Virginia and major in pre-med. Seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Knew at least knew what a doctor did. And, and so got talked out of that because, just a quick story, my mother knew the family of Dr. Maruka, who was at the time uh, uh, a chemistry professor here. And they said, okay, it's a, the school is close, but far enough. Obviously a good reputation. Um, let's do that. And, and I, I say that because that's really not a good reason to come. It's just not. You know, you should, you should have some better reasons to, go, to, to do something than that. You know, when I talk to high school kids or even college kids, you know, you've got to have better decision making. And you need data. And hopefully it's improved because in my time it wasn't. Anyway, so that's the role model theme is important. And, and I, I can't echo enough. Role models are just so critical. I know with my young kids I tried to give them opportunities and expose them to all sorts of things that they could then make their own decisions, but at least provide information. And it just didn't exist, at least for me in my era. But came to AB, that was really good serendipity. It was a happy stance. It was a good experience. It, it I think, worked out. And for me, I learned a few things. One, I didn't want to be pre-med. Um, did okay, but really didn't have the passion for it that, you know, my, my good friend Dr. Christensen has for it and so on. Still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. For me, I think I learned a couple things at AB. It was first exposed to people outside of Braxton County, West Virginia, which is a huge deal. You know, as we all know, we have a lot of, of, of students from other states and also other countries. There was one bad influence from Micronesia. My roommate for nearly four years is in the audience, but <laughs> we'll set that aside. Um, and, and so good exposure, that's important for kids. And for me particularly, being sort of uh, sequestered. A second was being exposed to options professionally, and, and so I became a chemistry major and picked up math along the way, and had some exceptionally good teachers. Again, I mentioned Dr. Morote, who's my favorite teacher, uh, amazing man. And um, <clears throat> but you know, learned some things, but I still didn't figure out sort of what I wanted to do from here. Got a good background, had the experience with that. Wasn't to do, and it, frankly, there still wasn't good role models for, for going to places. It, certainly in the health sciences, there were here, but I really didn't want to do that. That You guys work way too hard. 
So I talked to Dr. Digman quite a lot, and this is a Digman lecture, and I do, I'd do i be remiss if I didn't say I'm, I'm truly honored to be involved in this because he was one of my favorite people. I'd never had him for class. He had, he had moved on to become chairman of the, I guess, natural sciences at the time and dean. But having said that, I, I got a chance to spend a lot of time with the man, had huge respect. And I remember talking to him quite a lot as a sophomore and as a junior. And he said, you know, what do you want to do, and can I help you with that? And I said, you know, I really would like to, I'm thinking about, I like chemistry, but I'd really like to do some applied things. And I'm not sure you can do it from here. And he says, well, look, he says, I'm a Penn State grad. I can get you into the Penn State Chemical Engineering Program under a, a National Science Foundation fellowship for a, for a term. And I said, well, let's do that. You know, let me see what that world is like. And he did that. So, in fact, I could, you could say that he was the, the fellow who sort of put, put me in the path I ended up on. And so I went to Penn State for uh, a term and worked with a, a professor, Klaus, who's a very large name in uh, petroleum engineering. And in fact, we were working on the development of Mobile One, the first synthetic um, lubricant. And I was involved in that. And uh, I learned a lot from that. I learned a couple things. I one learned that the chemical engineers there weren't brighter than any of the guys at AB. And in fact, we probably were better in, in chemistry. That was good, that was important. You know, you have to benchmark yourself. You really don't know where you benchmark when you come out of, where I came out from, from Braxton County and then again from AB. You really don't. And so I spent some time benchmarking myself and I was, I was impressed that I think we did very well from here. And um, I also learned that I really liked that stuff. I didn't like the, the polymers, I didn't like the hydrocarbon chemistry, but I really liked the chemical engineering. My view of life was that those guys had all kinds of interesting opportunities, but yet they could still do chemistry. And so he said, I'm going to become a chemical engineer. That became a problem because, as you know, AB didn't have an engineering program. And so graduated in a chemistry degree and applied to chemical engineering grad schools, which may not sound like a big deal. It's actually quite a big deal because you fundamentally can't get into a grad school without an engineering degree uh, for the most part. Um, and so I applied to a few schools. Dr. Maruka was important. He was a Cornell chemical chemist PhD, and he said, you want to go to Cornell, because it's a, you know, it's a top two or three school, and I can, he, he, you know, we'll try. And I applied there, I applied some other places, and I was actually going to MIT, actually. And um, I got a call, and I'll share this with you, from a, a Professor Von Berg from Cornell in chemical engineering. And he says, um, he says I'm Von Berg. Um, he says, um, I want you to come here. And, and um, he says, the reason I want to come here, he says a couple things. He said, I, I was made aware that there was this kid from a small school in West Virginia with no engineering degree. It, we, we talked about it in our applications committee. After we laughed a lot, I looked at it and realized that, you know, you were who you were. And he, I want you to come here. And I said, well, why? And he says, well, a couple things. Dr. Von Berg had been, he was German. He had been part of the Punamunde project, if you're aware of it, in, in Germany, which is their atomic bomb program. And he and some other Germans had been brought over and became part of the Los Alamos program. He's quite a large name, actually. And um, during that, his transition, he had been placed with a family in West Virginia to acclimate to, to American life, actually outside Wheeling. And he had such a great experience from that. And he had such a huge uh, respect for West Virginians and the life and so he says, the first kid I've seen apply from West Virginia anywhere. He says, you're up on a farm. He says, he says, I'm at the end of my career. I wasn't going to take any more PhD students. He says, come here. We'll give you a full scholarship. You'll be my last PhD student. I said, cool deal. I did that. I never saw Cornell first day. I showed up as first day of classes. And um, basically a lot of trust. And it turned out to be quite serendipitous. Um, and you form a graduate committee, if you're familiar with... Uh, at least engineering grad school. And I had an incredible committee, a uh, group of people. The uh, other guy on my committee was Hans Bethe. I don't know if the name means anything to you, but he's a Nobel laureate, developer of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and so I had a Hans Bethe, uh, Robert von Berg, and the third fellow was um, um, Pete Harriet, who uh, was department chair and, and, um, and is the author of the Chemical Engineering Handbook. In fact, later in life, one of my great honors was to write Chapter 7 of the new revised Chemical Engineering Handbook with Pete Harriet. He's now 98, he's still alive, and I still talk to him. Um, but the point is, I had tremendous professors, tremendous, and they were so supportive. And, and, he, and Von Berg says, um, 
And he says, so what do you want to do? What's your goals? We have to have goals here. And he said, my goal is to get the hell out of here as quick as I can and make some money. <laughs> he says, good goal. That's a goal. I like that. He says, you have to learn some things first. And you first have to repeat. You have to take some undergraduate engineering courses, which, frankly, was more difficult than graduate courses. <clears throat> so I had to do that. had to take graduate courses and, um, and also get the hell out. A lot of goals. Um, I, I actually, it, it, so I did, to not waste your time, did a lot of work in um, the separation of uranium-235-238 by developing membranes to do that separation to do enriched uranium, actually. And so learned a lot about chemical separations and, 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 um, and so on. And luckily, the research went really well. You know, it, it, it may not. The average time for a PhD in Cornell is seven years. Um, I, we did it in three and a half. And um, it was lucky research. It went super well. And the other big factor was my wife was pregnant. I married, as many of you know, uh, an AB grad. We got married as soon as we graduated. And so she was with me at Cornell. And she got pregnant. And there is nothing that incentivizes you more than being poor and a child on the way. Almost nothing. And, and so I said, we, we got we to gotta do this. So he said, absolutely, let's do this. So we pushed it. We got it through. Graduated, learned a lot, had great experiences. And so we come to serendipity again. So what do you do from there? Um, I graduated in 81. And um, it was an interesting year because there were, if I remember correctly, there were about 20 PhD chemical engineers graduating that year. Only seven, I remember this number, who could have security clearances who were American citizens. And so I had. 30 job offers. I mean, everybody and their brother, you know, it was job offers. It was fabulous. It was ridiculous. I felt wanted for the first time in my life. You know, it was just amazing. And I intended really to go to the U.S. government and continue some, some, um, some work in, in um, energy, <coughs> and either that or DuPont, and we were bouncing back and forth, and we did all these trips. And so serendipity, uh, we had a trip to Pittsburgh with Alcoa, and it went okay. It was fine. It was interesting. The, the chief technology officer of Alcoa wanted me. Good man. Just wasn't quite right. And he kept pushing, kept pushing. He says, come back and try again. And I said to my wife, you know, that Marriott in Monroeville, they put us up, a, has the world's best French onion soup. <laughs> and we have a free weekend. Let's just go back to Monroeville. We'll talk to Alcoa again, but we can eat a lot of French onion soup. And I share that story because I've done interviews where people said, how did you end up at Alcoa? And I said, it's French onion soup. And it's, it's, Vab's, it's not quite true, but it's partly true. So we went back, we did the weekend, and, and Carl Wafers, who was the chief technology officer of Alcoa, said, what will it take? And I said, well, introduce me to your CEO. I said, you know, that's a pretty big ask because Alcoa is a very significant organization. And I did. I met Charlie Perry. He, he came to dinner with us, and he was CEO of Alcoa. And Charlie said, what? He says, he says I'll make you an offer. And he says... We're Alcoa. We're the aluminum company of America. What I would like to do is do something in non-aluminum. How would you like a job being the first guy in a new department figuring out what the hell we should be doing in non-aluminum? I said, that sounds pretty cool, except I want a budget. And so we got a budget. The budget was pretty big, including buying companies and creating a business. Okay. That was impressive. So he, and he honored it. To Charlie's credit, he honored it. So I spent the next several years developing a group which became called Alcoa Separations. And we developed some technologies. We hired a bunch of people. We built facilities. We did a bunch of really cool stuff. And uh, one of the more interesting ones, I'll just point out a couple of quick things. Um, we developed the, um, the uh, fructose-glucose-sucrose separation, which is now became the commercial uh, high-fructose corn syrup. That was my first patent. And uh, we did that in 1983. Uh, we also developed ceramic membranes for drinking water and we, we were, the first installation was this large installation was the city of Paris which was my first billion dollar project and so we, we did some cool stuff and it was really going well and we built a business that was at the time was about a 500 million dollar a year business it was pretty significant and then Charlie Perry retired and he was replaced by um, a guy uh, Paul O'Neill if you're into business you may know the name but Paul O'Neill came in as chairman of Alcoa. I met him on his second day in office. 
Paul says, you know all that stuff about non-aluminum you guys got going? You've got ceramics going. You've got chemical separations. You've got water. You've got, you know, you've got anodized aluminum batteries. You've got all these things. Get rid of all that crap. We're going back to aluminum. We are an aluminum company. He says, you've got till the end of the year to get rid of everything. And I remember thinking, I'm 28 years old. I knew nothing about selling a business. Nothing. I knew nothing about business, Steve. I remember you, you were a business major here, and I remember laughing, thinking, I never had a business class. I never had a business class. I had no clue what I was doing. Um, and <laughs> well, we, we, we made a lot of mistakes, so I will share with you. But we, we, it's really actually quite hard to sell $500 million in businesses in six months. But we did. And so I'm sitting at the end of the year thinking, and I said this to my wife, I'm, I'm 29 years old. I'm the youngest vice president in Alcoa. I hate aluminum. I don't want to be here. Um, what am I going to do? And um, I had a friend who'd started a little company because we were doing membrane work at the time. We had done some very cool membrane work. It was very new at the time. And he started this little company, and he said, come on over. You and me will be first people in, and we will, we will develop membranes to desalinate seawater to make drinking water around the world. And so that's pretty cool. I like that. Let's do that. So we did, and I moved my family to northern New Jersey. My youngest was five days old. Um, my oldest was six years old, four of them. And my wife, to her credit, was absolutely supportive, tremendously supportive. Whatever you want to do, we're here, we're going to do it. And we did. And it was a little company called Xenon Environmental. And um, long story short, we, we luckily were successful. And we did some cool stuff. We grew. And um, our first major project, everybody has to have a hit. I, I tell this when I do entrepreneurship work with people starting companies. You've got to have a champion somewhere. If you just get one, we lucked out. Our first one was Sheikh Maktoum of Dubai. And he wanted to build the first big desalin real desalination plant in the world in Dubai. And he threw money at this thing. So we screwed up badly, but we did it. And we did that. And then we did Saudi Arabia and Oman and Kuwait, and then we moved on. But the point is, um, we did pretty well. And so, and then from there, I have to waste your time with a quick story. We developed a thing called membrane bioreactors, which we went to wastewater and said, you know, we can do really cool stuff with this. We can do membranes that will give you pure water to drink from sewage. Nobody's excited. I'm looking at this audience. <coughs> it was a hard sell in those days, by the way. It's still a hard sell today to some people. Anyway, long story short, we were pitching this. We were all over the place pitching this uh, technology for taking direct sewage to drinking water. I'll, I'll share a really quick story, hopefully, with you. We were pitching to the military, and they were really interested. So we built a tractor trailer and put it at Fort Lee, Virginia, with the Army Medical Corps. And at the back end of the trailer, soldiers would come basically to the latrine, and you would walk around to the front of the trailer and have a glass of water. They wanted to demonstrate that it worked and that it was physically, and it does, it, it's great. Now, you guys are getting excited, but it hasn't hit West Virginia yet because you don't have a water problem. But I built the first one in Namibia, and we've built them all over the world now. The city of San Diego just built a very large one. The point is that technology's done really, really well. Um, you've done it in places you probably don't even know. If you've been to Giant Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey, you're drinking xenon recycled units. Anyway, forget all that. We did well. <laughs> got excited. Um, we, we took the company public in 1997, and we sold it to GE in 1999. And, and, and GE liked this whole stuff. It became they re rebranded as G Water, and today it's a, it's a $5 billion company. Uh, and so I jumped out at that point as president, and there was one more bit of the story. Right at the end of that, I went to Harvard. And the reason I have to share this with you, I went to Harvard because I knew nothing about business, and yet I was running a pretty large company. And it was scary as hell because I had not had a business class. I knew nothing about business. I was learning it on the fly, which is not the way to do it. Um, and so... My wife said, I said, she said, why do you want to do Harvard? And I said, well, because we're sitting in Philadelphia, and I can go to Penn, which is a very good business school, Wharton. I'm an adjunct professor there. And um, yeah, but look, it, it's like going to AB, and it was like going to Cornell. You want to challenge yourself against the best. And so we did Harvard. And so I would fly up Thursday night every week and come back on Sundays, and I did a two-year executive program. 
And um, I learned a couple things. Again, one of them is people at AB were as good as anybody at Harvard. They're just, they're just okay. They're good. They're not great. That was important. I know that doesn't sound like a big deal. It's actually a big deal because there's a lot of mystique about these kind of schools. And these people are okay. They're good. Frankly, in general, they're not as motivated. Motivation is critical. I was highly motivated. I missed this whole point. When I came to AB, I was highly motivated. I did not want to go back to the farm. There, there was a study several years ago, actually out of Harvard, which looked at 500 CEOs of U.S. corporations and what motivates them. And the number one motivator, you may think, is money, power, sex. That was the number, that was, those were three. That was not number one. Number one is fear of failure. Fear of failure. And that's actually true because for me, I didn't want to go back and work in a coal mine or be on a farm. And so, it, it wasn't fear, but it's, it, that's, that was the drive. It wasn't to make money or power or any of those other things. So, um, I got sidetracked now. But, um, so, we, so they, they weren't as motivated, but they were, they were pretty good. Um, that was, experience was good for me in many ways. One of them, just to tell you a quick story of Harvard, if you're familiar with Harvard Business School, they teach by the Socratic method, which fundamentally makes, means it's um, half the class score is FaceTime. Is face they show up, the professor shows up every day, he starts screaming out questions and people have to respond and they shout over each other. That's not me, I'm a techie. I grew up in the analytical, think about it, be respectful of people's opinions world. That's not Harvard. Harvard is elbow the guy next to you out of the way, shut him up, take your face time, and, and hopefully have the right responses to the questions. Completely different. And I did okay. You know, I survived. And so, um, and learned a lot about business. So that was good. And from there, um, I'll make the story fast forward. So, we, But there are a couple of other relevant things. So after that, I learned enough about big business, water, and power that uh, I learned that finance became important. And so I had an opportunity. I was called by a chairman of a company in the UK called Severn Trent. It's a large UK-based company that said, you know, we have a lot of money, and we'd really like to expand around the world, and we'd like, what do you want to do? And I said, you really what I'd like to do, and I've learned, is that money is important in these projects. And so what I'd like to do is basically run around, starting in the U.S., and buy up water, wastewater, and energy facilities and operate them because the U.S. government doesn't fund these things, and, and taxpayer money doesn't work well, and, and I think we can do a, a decent pitch here. So that's what we did. We took $500 million dollars. It sounds like a lot of money, but it's not. And, and we started buying up, and we became the largest in the U.S. and fourth largest in the world, um, water, power, municipal facilities. We bought them and operated them, and also privates. We operated Coca-Colas. We operated Pfizer. We operated a bunch of others. And then we started uh, uh, solid waste. So we, start, we bought up all these little garbage handlers, and we put them together, and we called it Republic Waste. We became the second largest waste management firm in the world behind Waste Management, Inc. And then we did a couple other things. We rolled up analytical laboratories, and it was called Severn Trent Labs, and we were the largest environmental labs in the world. So, so we did some things, and we developed a billion-dollar corporation, and it was fun. And then one day, I went home to my wife and said, I think I'm going to leave this. And she says, why? I said, well, I got this call from a friend who's in this regional engineering construction firm, but they, they're in a cool area. And I think that would be a fun area because I like this financing and create the ability to create technical things, water, wastewater, energy projects, particularly alternative energy. Now we're moving into solar and wind and natural gas and so on. And I like this, this area, and it's growing. And this was in the uh, early 2000s. And I remember, I have to share with you what she said to me. She said, so let me understand this. You have a nice cushy job where you sit on your ass all day and people report to you and you basically just read reports and you don't really have to do anything. Instead, you're going to go to this regional treatment, you know, this regional engineering firm where you're basically going to be on an airplane going all over the world all the time and, and have to really work. And I said, yeah, isn't it cool? And so that's what we did. And uh, it was called Hatch, Hatch Limited. It's based in Canada, but we became um, actually the world's largest privately held engineering construction firm. And when I left, we were 38,000 employees and 27 billion annual sales. But we basically grew with mining, oil and gas, coal, China. 
China became our biggest client. So we were building power plants in China. We were doing a coal-fired power plant a month in China. I mean, we were building, you know, uh, platinum rhodium mines in South Africa. We were doing uh, massive water and reuse facilities in Australia. We were doing large projects. I mean, really large projects. And it was really cool. It was just fun. Our problems were finding people and figuring out how to do it. And the difference with big projects were just the number of zeros. So the same as a small project with the same number of headaches, it's just got more zeros. And, and um, so I learned a lot about how you have to work with governments and how you have to finance those things. Because when you're doing you know, a $29 billion natural gas facility in Australia that's going to China, you have to figure out how to keep the governments happy, the Indians happy, you know, everybody happy. It's, it's a pretty significant thing. But we did some cool stuff. And then I retired out of that running it in um, uh, 2013. And from that time, um, as Lynn had said, it moved to followed the money, basically. So I'm managing um, Morgan Stanley's infrastructure fund, which is five and a half billion dollars, and, and then a couple of other funds at other companies. But it's not the money. All the money's doing is allowing us to do cool stuff. And so we're doing, uh, you know, Neom in, in, in Saudi Arabia, which is the world's first fully sustainable city, you know, completely powered on its own. All the waste is recycled. Um, tremendous concepts and technology being developed to do that, and they'll be, apply other places. So that's, that's the interesting part. Um, and, and I'll finish on that one by um, wanting to do things in West Virginia. I keep coming back to how do we improve the state, which is a different subject. But we, we were doing um, uh, lithium recovery facilities in Australia and South Africa. And we started doing, we did a rare earth facility in, 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 in uh, Australia. And so we started doing work looking at where rare earths and lithium are. And it, you may be aware that the second highest concentration of rare earths in the world is acid mine drainage in West Virginia, bituminous coals. And so we've been very focused on doing about a $400 million project here in West Virginia for taking acid mine drainage, converting uh, abandoned waste coal mine sites, and recovering rare earths, generating pure water from them, creating jobs, hopefully in the order of 10 to 20,000 in the first year. Um, and so we have the funding, and, and luckily Senator Manchin has earmarked $140 million in the infrastructure bill for us as well. And, and I'm, I cannot tell you, I'm more excited I am than that, that project than any one we've ever done, because it means giving back, hopefully creating some things in the state, It'll involve a fair amount of spin outs to universities, hopefully, hopefully it be as well in terms of student alignment and internships and create programs specifically for technology to extract and separate rare earths, technologies for recovery and, and purification and the health effects and, and the pure water. So there's a, a lot of spin outs to that. So I'll just finish with that with saying, you know, having talked to a lot of student groups is, you know, I get these questions about, you know, what can you do today? We don't see. And I say, are you kidding me? You have no, there's no more potential. There's more potential today than any other time. If I were, you know, 18 instead of 65, I, I mean, I would be incredibly excited today. I'm still excited. I'm not retiring. Why would you retire? There's so many cool things to do. And, and so I come back to the subject title, uh, Serendipity and James Hangers. So you probably... I got to share, you know, stupid stories with you. My kids hate this. I love factoids. All kinds, you know, we would do road trips. I have factoids about everything. And, and one of them, of course, since we're sitting here, is Civil War history. And so, so we're all, of course, familiar with the Battle of <coughs> Philippi, you know, June 2 and 3, 1861. And many of you may not know James Hanger, though. I don't know. But, uh, you know, there were casualties on both sides. Right? And so on the Confederate side, there was this young private who had just enlisted the day before. He had been in the Army one day, Confederate Army, from Virginia. And he was here, and he was wounded fairly severely, and his leg was amputated. His name was James Hanger. And he was sent back home. His mother said to him, says, you were in the Army one day. You got shot in the morning of your second day. That's pretty bad luck, you know, by anybody's definition, right? You lose a leg, in those days, losing a leg is a pretty significant event. It's still a significant event, but probably more significant in those days. James Hanger didn't go home and, and, and you know, cry. He took uh, barrel stays, if you know what barrel stays are. He took the size, slats of barrels, and he developed the first movable hinged prosthetic. 
and he, he used it for himself, and he, it worked. And then he developed more, and he started doing this. And the fast forward to this, if you're familiar, is that at the Hanger Prosthetics uh, Group is the world's largest prosthetics group. It's a multi-billion dollar public company. James Hanger died as a multi-millionaire several times over. Now, is that relevant? Money doesn't mean anything. My point is, talk about taking lemons to lemonade. I mean, you know, in bad life. so I had to share that with you since we're in Philippi, and I have to share one more thing with you. I think about that every, almost every day, and the reason I do, in my office, I have <clears throat> a few things that are meaningful. One of them is a key to Old Main. I have a paperweight on my desk, and I think about that every day. And across from my desk, I have a Harper's um, original drawing. I have to share this with you while we're here. If you remember Harper's um, magazine, and pre- in the Civil War time, there wasn't photographs, and so they sent out artists. And so many years ago at an um, antique store outside of Washington, I happened to find an original colored, the original colored um, uh, drawing, I guess it is, hand-drawn, of the Battle of Philippi, of the Harper's artist sitting at this tree near where uh, the chapel is today. The, the, the tree's no longer there. It's where the cross is now. I remember it, though, as a student, exactly where that tree was. And I saw that, that picture, it wasn't a picture, it was a drawing. I said, I know that spot. I know that spot. I've been there many times. And I bought that, that, uh, that uh, drawing. It's on my wall, and, and you know, I can see it every day. So it's an original Harper's. And so, James Hanger. So I had to share that. So that's my story. I, I, I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, hopefully some of that made some sense to you. And thanks so much. <laughs>